sets in motion a very interesting and somewhat unpredictable kind of gyroscope, you know, um, to have a black female vice presidential candidate uh, presumably overcomes one of Hillary Clinton's weakest points in 2016. Hi, I'm Dr. Jed McCosco at academicinfluence.com and Wake Forest University. And we have another wonderful guest today on our little interview show here. Uh, it's Professor Don Green. And he has uh, lots to say about how he got interested in his field when he was a young person and what has happened since then. So why don't you start at the very beginning, Don? How did you get interested in what you're now doing as a career? Years ago, way back when, at the beginning of the Reagan revolution, I just inadvertently, with no particular plan, signed up to be an intern in the House Committee on Energy and Commerce and arrived at the ripe old age of, of 19 as a political science major. And um, it, was, it was sort of funny because in my first week there, the legislative director for the committee said, you know, Green, you could, you could do the intern scud work or you could just keep your mouth shut and follow me around all summer. So it's kind of up to you. And I thought, well, I'll take the latter job. And so I was, I was basically like a fly in the wall for the whole summer while, you know, essentially the Reagan revolution and, you know, attempts to slow it down in the house um, unfolded. And that was a fascinating wow. experience. And I came back thinking, you know, I could do this for a job. Yeah. Well, how did you get into uh, political science as a major as a 19 year? You, you'd already figured that that was your major. And, and what led to that? Yeah, I was a history and political science major. So I was, you know, in that sort of lemming like furrow on the way to law school and i was okay. planning on going to law school and um being a being you know, a lawyer just just a regular old lawyer i i, I think so and i okay. you know it was it was obvious that my heart was not in it and it took a long time for um certain parents to kind of accept that this was oh. not going to happen but but oh. that's okay uh you know things worked out very well i think in the yeah. end and I, yeah. I think i would have been an okay lawyer but you know because my habits of mind are much more that of an academic. I'm, yeah. I'm glad I made this decision I did. Well, do you think your parents would be proud of you that you are now the number one most influential political scientist ever in the world right now? Well, I think <laughs> they would surely think of it as a computer glitch. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's what they that would one. say. Well, okay, so you, you got interested as a 19-year-old, and um, you realized you could do this for a living. And then what, what happened that led you to the specific area of political science that you are known for and, and, and so influential in? That's the uh, further irony of it. Uh, I went to uh, Berkeley for no particular reason other than my my middle brother. It was at Berkeley. He's now a philosophy professor. Um, oh, okay. I went to went to Berkeley, and I went there to study political philosophy of all things, um, and and even started down the track of doing that. I took the PhD exam in political philosophy, and then it was it was in a class in political behavior taught by Jack Citron, ultimately my dissertation advisor. Um, that I became a running dog of empiricism, much more interested in, you know, how it is that people came to think the things that they did. And gradually, my interest shifted in the direction of political behavior research. And um, I was sort of a survey research guy. I, I, I had an office at the Survey Research Center at Berkeley, now mm -hmm. defunct, but there it was. And that's what I did for about the first five or so years of my career, and then gradually shifted over to my current focus, which is field experimentation in the social sciences. And, you know, I think that that's, that was the, the move that in some sense, you know, changed my whole academic outlook. Mm -hmm. and, and what does it mean to, um, for you, do the field research? Because we've, we've been talking to a lot of political scientists. Some of them deal just with numbers, just with, you know, survey data. Um, others of them are more like anthropologists. They, they go out there and they talk to people. Uh, and we've actually had interviews with a lot of uh, anthropology professors, and, and obviously they do that kind of field work. So tell us a little bit about how that shift happened after five years of, of doing more of the survey thing to going out into the field. Well, my uh, close collaborator, Alan Gerber, uh, and I began to debate, you know, what kinds of bedrock knowledge exist in political science? You know, what, what are the really well-supported empirical foundations on which we build our theories? And essentially, you know, Alan and I, I remember the day we were doing it. We literally argued for hours about every proposition we could think about. And I, I started off more optimistic than he, he was, but at the end, you know, he really won me over. And we launched an experiment in 1998 to get at really the most fundamental 
empirical question, you know, uh, to what extent does encouraging people to, to vote cause them to turn out? Um, it sounds like a, a pretty obvious thing to study, but but really very few people had studied it uh, in the decades uh, leading up to our study. And I think once we saw the, the kinds of things that could be learned from a randomized trial conducted in a real world setting, you know, it opened up um, many more questions, many more research opportunities, and you know, lots of unexpected things happened. You know, when you when you have a, a research finding, in this case, that door-to-door -door canvassing worked well, but that telemarketing calls didn't work so well, um, you know, you become kind of the little darling of all the people who say, you know, that's right, we should be doing more canvassing, and and that leads to many more. Um, uh, experiments and now hundreds and hundreds of experiments in not only on turnout but also on persuasion on all sorts of things including mass media um, not just in the United States but all over the place you know I, I feel as though I could never really return back to my my old rather rather insular um, download some data and analyze it past the uh, mode of doing research mm -hmm. so you your roots are sort of in download data and and analyze it from those sort of first four years you spent um, looking at surveys. Um, and yet you've moved into this on the ground field research, door to door even canvassing. Um, so so how do those two things interact now? You say you 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 always come back to your roots of of downloading and analyzing, but you're out there doing the field work. So tell us more about how those interplay. Well, I would say that most recently, you know, I've I've kind of melded my early days as a survey guy um, with my more current mode as a field experiment guy. Mm -hmm. um, insofar as I've been doing randomized experiments in East Africa on the effects of mass media exposure mm -hmm. on social attitudes and behaviors. And what has been fun about that is to go to these locations, for example, in rural Uganda or rural Tanzania, to talk to, to villagers um, about issues like violence against women or teacher absenteeism and to get a sense of their their perspective um, and also to, to in some sense revisit the golden age of survey research where people had never been surveyed before and where people are not necessarily drumming their fingers counting the minutes you know they they're they're very uh, pleased to talk to you about social issues and in many cases it's the first time anyone has ever expressed interest in what they think um, hmm. So that part has really been fascinating. And it's, of course, opened up a totally new part of the world to me, but also a new way of uh, thinking and doing things. Um, and the fact that the you know response rate is 98% means it's a welcome departure from the, the you know, almost intractable problems of interviewing in the West. Interesting. So you yourself fly over to East Africa, go to different villages, talking to people, surveying people. Um, who helps you with that so that you can get enough data to be meaningful? Well, it's, it, in this particular case, it's um, it's field organizations, in this case, uh, Innovations for Poverty Action, which was founded actually by a colleague and friend of mine, um, Dean Carlin. And they've essentially got offices in a variety of, of countries, not just in East Africa. And mm -hmm. they have been instrumental in, you know, orchestrating the and having a professionalized group of survey takers, enumerators, mm -hmm. um, and, and then I've also had just the most amazing graduate students and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, colleagues working on these projects with me. So I've learned as much from them as I have from anyone. Yeah. So, wow, that must be really exciting. So in, a, in combination with your own conversations with East Africans and then all of the data you get back from these professionals who've been trained to do surveys, your graduate students who go, I assume they go over there as well and do yeah. surveys. You've just learned a lot. Um, and is that just in the last few years that you've been doing that project in East Africa? That's right. I mean, it goes back to a, a dissertation that I advised way back in in the you know, roughly 2007 uh, period. But I never was the person to be on the ground to do it myself um, until my very you know, brilliant and accomplished uh, former student who's now a professor at, at Princeton, Elizabeth Levy Palak, uh, couldn't couldn't do it on the ground because she was having a baby at the time. So I thought, well, you know, now it's time for me to go go do it. And um, it's really really fascinating. And now that I've done it, I I've continued to do it. So I, I started off in Uganda, did two two three studies there, and now um, I'm on my fourth study in Tanzania. And uh, wow. it's really fascinating. That is really cool. So um, were those first studies in Uganda the first time you had 
gone out and done survey research for a while? Like, had you taken a break from actually being on the ground and asking people questions? Or yeah, that was. I mean, I've, I've certainly done lots of American politics-related survey work. Um, mm -hmm. Lots and lots of that, especially associated with experiments on campaigns and elections. But this was the first time that I'd actually gone to do data collection in East Africa. And uh, it was just a, a fascinating experience to do one-on-one -on -one depth interviews and then to build from there to an actual survey that was closed-ended to do multiple waves of, of surveys, not only to interview villagers, but also members of their family and their extended communities um, to learn how to sample uh, we use Google Earth to take photographs of these villages and figure out, you know, um, all of the the radii that would encompass uh, the the structures that we could see from outer space. So it's really oh, wow, that is so really cool. Neat. So so you you've done a lot in the United States. This is the first time you went to East Africa, but was it the kind of thing? Like I know for me as a professor of physics, I I did a lot of the hands-on research. I'm an experimentalist. I was doing the actual experiments myself for a number of years, but then graduate students kind of took over and I'm just in my office writing for grants and things like that. Is that what happened to you prior to that first trip to Uganda? I think that it's true that, you know, increasingly I was reliant on postdocs and graduate students. And then, you know, I think that, you know, a variety of things, some not so great, uh, caused me to get more intimately you know, involved in the data collection process myself. Um, but also I was drawn in by, by you know, the opportunities that um, were afforded to me by, you know, um, wonderful students, uh, eager, eager funders. Um, you know, there are lots of people who want to know about the conditions under which people are persuaded by messages, including media messages. And so now the, the idea of studying systematically media messaging has gone from a kind of sideline of mine to, to really something that I'm really primarily focused on. Okay, so that, that's become your primary focus to survey people and how they're responding to mass media, multimedia, different forms of, of, of messaging. But not just not just messaging that's happening in the world, but messaging that has been randomly configured. I mean, that's the idea is that that, for example, in the Uganda study, um, we you know rolled out first in 56 villages and then in 112 villages, a randomized trial in which uh, people were exposed to messages on, say, violence against women or teacher absenteeism or abortion stigma or some other topic. Um, and that's the. Th that's the thing that really makes it exciting is that you're not just asking what do people think and correlating it with uh, the things to which they've been exposed. You're actually in, you're, you're, you're randomizing what they're exposed to. Wow, that is really cool. And that is truly uh, unique, I think, probably, I mean, not to you, but uh, just in my mind, the, the, to be able to go in and do that to a village. So t tell us more what that looks like. You, do you show up with... Um, ways to get the media to them if the village doesn't already have a way of getting that. So tell us more about the, the mechanics of how that happens. Yeah, the mechanics are rather interesting in insofar as, you know, these are very poor areas. They have no running water. They have no paved roads. They have no electricity. Um, only about one in, say, seven villagers has access to a smartphone. So you know, TV exposure is relatively limited. So the way we did it was we took advantage of a you know, a thing that is pretty much ubiquitous throughout rural um, Africa, and that is the uh, video hall in, in, in Luganda, it would be called a bibanda. And the idea oh. is that these video halls are places where you pay roughly the equivalent of five or 10 cents to watch about two hours of TV. What oh. we did is we deployed a bunch of Western movies as a film festival for four to six weeks and invited people to come for free. And then our uh, messages were shown during the commercial breaks and they were filmed interestingly in Luganda on location written by local screenwriters wow um, you know, so for the it was the first time that a local villager would see a movie actually in their setting in the native language wow and and those were the little videos and movies that had the messages about teacher absenteeism violence against women and then you randomized it in terms of which villages got to see which types of movies. Yes. Wow, fascinating. And Unbelievable. We, tried, we have a very light touch. You know, we tried to, we, this was not one of those kind of media studies where you show something and then you immediately interview them afterwards. 
you know, because I, I find that kind of obtrusive style of research very unconvincing. And so we did a general population survey of the village, regardless of whether people showed up to the to the event, um, two months later. Wow. It was unconnected to the to, to the event. That is such cool research, I have to say. I mean, I'm, I'm not a social scientist, but it's just neat how you were able to do a controlled experiment um, in that kind of setting. And, and just getting back to just understanding your career path, we, you know, it's, you, you took this job in Uganda because your colleague was having a child and it put you face to face with the, what was going on in the actual field work. Um, had you done stuff like where you were in the actual field work just prior to that in the United States and had you been doing it like on the ground or as I said before, were you more st stuck in your office while your postdocs and grad students were out there? Well, certainly I've done a lot of data collection uh, in American, you know, public opinion work. And, you know, that is typically involved uh, phone surveys and okay. online surveys. But, you know, the on the ground face to face stuff is relatively rare for me. Yeah, uh, I bet it would be. So it's been, has it been really fun for you as a as an academic? I, gosh, yeah, I bet you. Because I think that all the infirmities of, of current surveys um, you know, don't necessarily apply to East Africa because, I mean, other things apply, but, but not that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, I think one, one advantage of, of talking to people who are not surveyed to death is that, you know, they find it a very interesting and engaging conversation. They think hard about their, their responses. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they've often never had to translate what they think into, into a response. Interesting. Wow. Fascinating. So is it the kind of thing that you did that one first one in Uganda and you're really looking forward to the next one and the next one? And Absolutely. when did, when did I, they start? What, what year did you start that very first one? Well, the, the one with uh, Betsy Levy Palick, I think was 2006 and seven. Um, okay. The one that I started was 2014 and 15, 16. Um, and then it kept right on rolling into uh, Tanzania. Okay. Uh, so those studies, actually, the ones from Uganda are just being published this year. And wow. in Tanzania, you know, we're, we're in, the, in the hopper. Wow, that's really cool. Um, so it was actually quite a big gap from the very first trip you took to Uganda to then when you went back the second time on your own sort of uh, thing. It sounded like there was a... No, 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 sorry, the, oh. the one with Betsy, that was in Uganda. That was Rwanda. Oh, in Rwanda. So you did Rwanda with Betsy um, starting in 2007. Yes. And then uh, did you just keep going back year after year to different places? Um, no, no, no. Remember, she's doing all the field work until okay. she has the baby. And then okay. it's Don's turn to go uh, because okay. there's no Betsy. No, Betsy is totally amazing because she she learned Kenya Rwanda. She could, you know, wow. hang out with the, the local people. She she was beloved and famous throughout the country. Um, wow. Uh, it, no, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm not, I don't even rate on that scale. <laughs> so, so, okay, that makes more sense. Now you went to Rwanda one time. No, 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 not even that. Okay. Betsy does everything in Rwanda. For me, oh. I'm just, I'm just back in New Haven, you know, okay. uh, checking in with, I mean, we had all kinds of fun things to do in New Haven because Betsy, for example, you know, needed money, like in those days to wire money to, Kigali was not like a trivial thing. We had to figure out like the whole business office was 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 called into service. Anyway, <laughs> it was Betsy doing the on the ground work, and then it was only when Betsy couldn't go to do the the this particular job that I okay. And she and she I, couldn't do the particular job that was was in Uganda then yes. or okay. Yes. So and, she, and, couldn't, she couldn't collaborate on that project. I um, see. I get it. I get it. So project. you took it. You took it over completely, yeah. and that's when you started in in two thousand fourteen. 15, yeah. 16, yeah. and then moved into Tanzania. Okay, very good. Sometimes, you know, this thing takes a while to map out. And I think it's important for people to understand that here you are uh, already established in your career, and yet you turned over a brand new leaf just in 2000, really 2014 is when you first got there and did it on your own. So, um, and it's been a lot of fun for you. So <laughs> I guess that's encouraging for the younger people that watch this uh, interview that, as they pick their career, there are always going to be new surprises on the horizon down the road that can open up whole new dimensions of whatever career they go into. Um, That's right. I think that in particular, um, you know, 
there's a kind of restlessness associated with being an academic. And mm-hmm. some people just are constantly churning with, with projects and ideas. And, you know, I really enjoy the social aspects of, of working collaboratively. Mm-hmm. That has me going in all kinds of crazy directions. Well, it seems like you've gone in a really cool direction. Now, get, get, getting it back, sort of, we've looked at this one project that you've really focused on, on getting it back to sort of the bigger picture of Don Green and what, what he's up to. Um, does this stuff that goes on in Uganda and Tanzania represent the majority of your scholarship now, um, uh, starting in 2014 on? Or is this sort of one piece of your bigger scholarship that we just happen to be talking about in this interview? I'd say it's, it's one piece. I mean, it's certainly a piece that I love and I'm, I'm really engaged by it, but I'd say that, you know, to the typical person who's likely to run into this video, go, oh, Green, he's a, he's a scholar of you know, basically voter turnout and campaigns and elections in the United States. And, okay. So um, that's where you're really mainly known for. And you continue that work to this day and you'll be involved in, in the 2020 election and talking about what, what's going to turn out the vote and giving recommendations of whatever you want to do. And, and so, so what, let's go there. Let's talk about what's going to get out the vote in your uh, studies that is shown to be helpful to people who are trying to get their constituency out and, and vote. Well, I'd say that, you know, to a first approximation, the, the summary of hundreds of field experiments is basically, you know, the more personal and heartfelt and authentic, the more effective something is. Um, okay. So that you, know, you can send somebody an automated text message and get them to move just a little bit in terms of their probability of voting. But if you if you actually text a friend and say, you know, Don, I'm really counting on you to vote. You know, this this election is not a this is going to be a historic election, not one to sit out. You know, yeah, um, you'll raise my chances of voting considerably. And yeah. I think that that kind of friend to friend model of of engaging voters and and stimulating turnout is especially pertinent now under covid conditions where um you know you getting to people through impersonal means is not that easy no it sure isn't um do you have any thoughts about how it's all going to go down with covid and with campaigning towards the election i mean it's just going to be so different, won't it? And will all your research me- be meaningless in some ways, or is it still going to be basically the same thing, just in a different format? Well, I think that there are a few things that are swirling that could make it, you know, unpredictable, you know, especially things having to do with the integrity of the election or things that, ha- that call into question the integrity of the election. I have no idea where that would lead. But if you said, well, what's what's the election going to be about if there is no door-to-door canvassing and if there's no uh, there's nothing like a campaign rally, or you can't even really hold fundraiser events or activist events. You know, presumably the the world then turns to uh, friend to friend organizing models because mm-hmm. um, friends are still able to contact each other without being blocked, and they are quite effective when they do contact each other. So mm-hmm. that kind of decentralized model, which is not really typical for the United States, uh, might be something that's thrown into service uh, in, mm-hmm. in short order over the next few months. On the other hand, you know, I expect that we'll see the usual avalanche of. Um, TV. Oh, gosh. I'm not looking forward to that. (laughs) There won't be any shortage of that. But I don't think that that's necessarily uh, something that I expect to precipitate high voter turnout. I think Mm -hmm. high voter turnout is likely, in this case, again, assuming, you know, that the election is administered in a sensible way, um, because, you know, both sides are armed for bear there. They recognize that this is a turning point of an election. And, you know, I'd say that interest in the election is extraordinarily high. Yeah, definitely. So, and it's so uh, interesting that as we are filming this interview, you know, uh, compared to the one previously that we, we interviewed professor Nadia Brown from Purdue university, we didn't know who the democratic uh, vice presidential candidate was going to be. And, and now we do. So how does that change things in your mind just from, you know, an hour ago till now, is there any new developments that we can be thinking about as we uh, close out our interview right now? You know, it's really, it's, again, it sets in motion a very interesting and somewhat unpredictable kind of gyroscope, you know, um, to have a black female vice presidential candidate uh, presumably overcomes one of Hillary Clinton's weakest points in 2016, her inability to mobilize black voters. Um, 
not just to mobilize them, but to get them to to vote for her in, in, with enthusiasm. Um, and so if Biden can overcome that, he will overcome that infirmity. On the other hand, um, you know, part of Hillary Clinton's uh, problem in 2016, especially in battleground states, was her soft support among non-college ed educated whites. And so the question is whether uh, they now fall uh, more in the arms of, of Donald Trump than they otherwise would have been, uh, would have um, in the absence of this particular nomination. So it's a, it's an interesting game. But it's also interesting because California is nowhere near a battleground state. And um, so this is very different from uh, the nomination of Kane to deliver Virginia, because mm -hmm it's not necessarily her role to deliver her home state. No, no, it doesn't seem like it, but it should be interesting. And we are so honored to have been able to speak to the most influential political scientist uh, today, according to this computer glitch that you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> but no, seriously, we are so, so thankful to have this good perspective on what it means to do research in political science, uh, on the ground field research, like you've described to us so nicely, and also some of your perspective on what does turn out the vote and what we should be looking forward to in this 2020 election. So thank you so much, Professor Green. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me.